I want you to know right up front my purpose this morning. My purpose this morning is to challenge you to make sure that you've made a conscious personal decision to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. At the end of my message, I'm going to challenge everyone to make sure that you've made this decision. And then I'm going to guide you in prayer, and I'm going to invite you to walk down the front of the church during the last song as a public declaration that you have made a conscious personal decision to trust in Jesus Christ. You see, the reason that this is my purpose this morning is that we are finishing off the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount has been a great series for our church, hasn't it? It's been wonderful. It's been one of those series that you look back over and you think, man, God really changed people's lives as we studied through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But now we've come to verses 13 to 27. And throughout the the sermon, Jesus has been addressing his disciples. In in chapter 5, as Jesus began the sermon, it says that seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain and he sat down and he began to teach his disciples. But there is no doubt that the crowds who were following Jesus, who were not yet his disciples, were also there. And they had been overhearing what Jesus had been preaching about. But now as Jesus closes his sermon, it's as if he turns to the crowd and he addresses them. And as he does, he challenges them. He challenges them to make a personal, conscious decision to trust in him. He challenges them to become his disciple. And on Monday, as I was praying about this, I got a real burden Because I believe that there are people who come every Sunday to our church, and I'm so glad that you are here. But you are just like those crowds. You overhear what Jesus is saying to his disciples, but you have never made a conscious personal decision to trust in Jesus for yourself, that he is your Lord and Savior. And I also got a burden for all of the teenagers in our church. Because how often do we come to our teenagers and we challenge them and say, it's not just growing up in a Christian family that's important. You can have the best parents in the world, but unless you make a conscious personal decision, your eternal future won't be settled. So today is a day that I believe that God is challenging us. Make sure, make sure of your salvation. Make sure that you have made that cur- conscious personal decision to trust in Jesus for yourself. So today I want to answer this one simple question. Why do we need to personally decide to trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Why do we actually need to make that decision? Well, I believe that Jesus answers this question as we conclude this sermon. And I want to give you four words this morning, four words that answer the question, why do we need to make a personal decision and trust in Jesus. The first reason why we need to make sure that we made a personal decision and and are trusting in Jesus as our Lord and Savior is because of the first word. And the first word is found right there in verse 13. It's the word enter. Look down in your Bibles. Jesus says, you need to enter by the narrow gate. And what he means is that you need to actually decide that you're going to come in to the kingdom of God. You see, just as it's not enough If you want to get into your house to know where your front door is and to hang around the front door of your house, if you want to go into your house, you need to pass through the door. And in the same way, it's not just enough to know about Jesus and be coming to church or be raised in a Christian family. You need to make a personal decision that you are going to enter in. You need to come to that point in your life, as Jesus said, right at the beginning of the sermon, where you've realized your poverty of spirit where you've realized before God that none of your works will stack up on judgment day, and in his eyes, you are worthy of internal judgment, and you turn from living for yourself, and you receive Jesus as your Lord, the one who you've surrendered your life now to, and you receive him as your Savior, the one who died for you so that you could be forgiven. Jesus says, enter. Now, for the people listening to Jesus, this would have been huge. Who are they? The Jews. They think they're in. They're religious people. 
Jesus says, enter, enter, enter by the narrow gate. And in the same ways, we need to challenge ourselves today. Even if you're a religious person who's been going to church your whole life, have you entered? Have you made that personal conscious decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Now look at how Jesus describes the gate. What type of gate is it? He says it's a narrow gate. Now contrary to popular belief nowadays, not all roads lead to God. Not all religions are equally valid and true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the early church said the same thing. They said, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given amongst men by which you must be saved. Now, I know religious pluralism, it sounds very tolerant and loving, doesn't it? But in reality, I'd like to suggest to you that it's neither tolerant nor loving. It's not tolerant in the sense that it won't allow religions to make absolute truth claims. But when you look at all the five major religions of the world, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, and Christianity, they all make absolute truth claims. They all make claims about the nature of God, the nature of humanity, the nature of the afterlife, the nature of the human soul. As Dr. John Dixon says, he's a Christian who holds a PhD from Macquarie University in Sydney. He said, the basic problem with religious pluralism is that in trying to affirm all religions, it plays close attention to none of them. For the most part, the great religious traditions of the world make claims that are entirely at odds with each other. So you can't say with any honesty that all the religions teach the same thing about God and they're just different cultural expressions of the same truth. Joy Singh and Manoff Das are two young men who have been training with us for the past three years. And they're from India, one of the most religiously diverse nations on the earth. So I think if anyone is qualified to speak about religious pluralism, it would be them because they just step out of their front door and they're faced with all these different religions. But they will tell you that not all religions are the same, but they're very different, and they make very different assertions about God. Joy, for example, will tell you how he became a Christian from a Sikh background, and how Sikhism is vastly different from Christianity. It's not the same. So I think it's very racially ignorant that as Westerners, we think that it's they're all the same, because I think that's neither tolerant nor loving nor even well-informed to say that all religions lead to God. You see, if you really want to honor the religions of the world, then take a good look at them and ask the question, which is true? Is it Islam? Is it Buddhism? Is it Hinduism? Is it Christianity? Or is it even atheism, the belief that there is no God? Rather than just writing it off and claiming that they teach all the same thing, ask yourself, which one of these is true? And I think if you really sincerely search, you will find what many people have found, that when you look at them honestly, there is no one who stands out like Jesus. He is unlike all of the other religions and their founders. No one like Jesus claimed to be God and then backed up their claim by the life that they lived by dying and then rising from the dead. And his resurrection is actually a fact of history. And so if you're going to listen to anyone, listen to Jesus. And do you know what Jesus said? He said there's really only two pathways that people are actually on. The first pathway is the easy road which leads to destruction. Look down in verse 13. Jesus says, For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. The wide gate is our physical birth. From the moment we are conceived, we are conceived in sin, and we are born on the easy path that leads to destruction. We are born self-centered. We are born rebellious towards God. It's not hard for us to sin. In fact, it comes easy to all of us. If you've ever had children, you'll know what I mean. But ultimately, Jesus says that if we continue on that path, we are going to be headed for destruction. If we don't want God's good rule in our life, if we don't want, ha want what Jesus has to offer, if we just live for ourselves, then God will hand us over and he will give us what we want and he will cast us into hell. But there is hope because God loves us. 
There is a narrow gate, but it's narrow. It's a narrow gate to enter. Look down in verse 14. Jesus says, For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The narrow gate Jesus described in John 3 to a man named Nicodemus, he said these words. He said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You're born first time physically, and you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. And unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. When you turn to Jesus and submit to his lordship, and you believe in what he's done for you personally, then God the Holy Spirit comes to live within you and you, it's like being reborn. This is why Christians, when you meet Christians, they'll tell you that once I became a Christian, everything became new. Everything became new. The whole world was now new because you became a new Christian, a new creation. And even though the way is hard, even though you still battle with sin, and even though you may experience even more hardships now that you are a Christian, Jesus promises that it will eventually lead to life. It will lead to real life. It will lead to love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, self-control, all of these things in your life, regardless of the circumstances that you go through. And most importantly, It will lead to eternal life with God in his kingdom in the future. So why must you make a conscious, personal decision to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because Jesus says, enter. You need to enter. Not all religions are teaching the same thing. Don't be deceived. And the pathway that you are on by by default, by just being born, is the pathway that leads to destruction. So you need to make a personal, conscious decision to trust in Jesus and receive him as your Lord and Savior today. But let's look at the second word. The second word is the word beware. Beware. Look at what Jesus says in verse 15. He says, we need to beware of false prophets. The second reason why we need to make a personal, conscious decision to trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior is because Not every person is telling us the truth about God. There are voices in this world which will tell you everyone goes to heaven. Or you don't need to worry about these things. You can't know them anyway. Or maybe even for some of you teenagers or younger people here today, there is this voice in your head saying something like this. This is something that the old people need to worry about because they're closer to like death. But I don't need to worry about this in my life. But that's just not true. You never know the moment that God is going to call you to stand before him. A couple of months ago, the famous comedian Robin Williams died, and the basic refrain you heard over and over again was what? Was this refrain, he is now laughing up in heaven. According to the media, there was just no doubt about where he was. Well, Jesus says, beware, not all voices are valid. They might seem like they are sheep, little puffy, lovely sheep. If you've considered that analogy, they might seem like they're sheep, but they're actually ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. Sadly, there are even people who claim to be pastors and Christian leaders who say false things about God. A few years ago, a very prominent evangelical pastor shocked everyone when he brought out a book questioning whether divine judgment is eternal, whether hell is actually going to last forever. He suggested that in the end, love wins and that everyone gets to go into the kingdom of God. His book was, of course, a bestseller and caused quite a controversy. The only thing is that Jesus would disagree with them. As we've just read, Jesus says there's only two roads that you're on and these roads lead to eternal destinations. So you need to beware. You need to beware. You need to make sure that what is being told to you is true. It's actually what Jesus taught And Jesus tells us how you can recognize false teachers. Look down in verse 16. He says, you will recognize them by their fruits. You will recognize them by the way that they live and by the way that the people they teach live. So don't be sucked in by cleverness and the skillfulness of someone's presentation. Don't be just sucked in by churches or apparent churches that offer great programs for your children and for your family. 
Now, I don't believe that there's anything wrong, obviously, with lights, good music, and PowerPoint. And I don't believe that there's anything wrong with running great programs for the whole family. We do that. But Jesus says that's not the most important thing. Jesus says you need to be looking for fruit. I wonder, what do you look for when you search for a new church? Most people, when they look for a new church, they look for superficial things, like whether the music is good or the programs cater for the whole family and whether the facilities and marketing is good. Now, these are all considerations, I know. But Jesus says there is something deeper than that. What is the fruit? What is the fruit of the pastor's life and his church's life? Look for things like this. How does he handle his finances? Is, it all, is he sexually pure? Is the ministry all about building his own empire or is he raising up others for the good of the gospel? Do they practice what they preach or is there a disconnect between what they say and how they live? When you look at their lives, can you see the evidence of God's spirit changing their character? But most importantly, look at their teaching. Are they willing to say the difficult things? Are they willing to teach on uncomfortable topics like divine judgment, church discipline, sexual ethics? Are they motivating people not by a whole list of rules, but by the love and grace of Jesus? Are they getting to the heart issues? Now, as I say this, I say this with fear and trembling because I claim to be a teacher. I claim to be a pastor. And I'm not a perfect person. I'm desperately in need of God's grace every single day. I'm a work in progress. So this is a challenge for me. Is my life bearing fruit and is your lives bearing fruit, true fruit, lives that are pleasing to God? Not a whole heap of froth and bubble and just mere excitement, but real character that's pleasing to our Heavenly Father. See, I don't want to be giving you false information about God, but that's for me. What about for you? You need to beware. You need to be careful. Not every voice that's speaking on Christian radio and Christian television is telling you the truth about God. Not every Christian book that you'll pick up in Kurong is a good Christian book. You need to learn discernment. You need to beware because these voices can be keeping you from making a personal decision to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, it gets even more heavy. And, and these are the words of Jesus not my words. Let's look at the third word. So we've seen the word enter and we've seen the word beware, but there is a third word, which is actually two words that I want to emphasize today, and they are the words, not everyone. Look at right at the beginning of verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Are you trembling right now at what God says in his word? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, to be sure, no one who doesn't say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 10 verse 9 says you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. But what this is telling us is that intellectual orthodoxy does not equal saving faith. You can be absolutely a brainiac when it comes to memorizing scripture. You can be a brainiac and know Wayne Grudem's systematic theology off by heart, and you've not truly entered in to the kingdom of God. And Jesus gives us two very challenging reasons why. He says, first, not everyone who professes actually possesses salvation. Look in verse 21 again. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, some of you are probably thinking, what, uh, what's this about? I thought we're saved by grace. Well, Ephesians 2 verse 8 does say this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So salvation is a gift. God gifts us salvation. It is by grace that we are saved. But the church reformers in the 16th century had a great expression, which I think really, really is very informative on this issue. They said this, 
They said, why we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the faith that saves is never alone. True saving faith will result in a changed life. True saving faith results, as Jesus says in verse 21, in doing the will of the Father. Now, what if you're freaking out right now? You're sitting there and you're freaking out and you're thinking, when I look at my life, I don't see any works. What should you do? Well, the answer is not for you to now start get working. The answer is not to, for you to try and start squeezing out some fruit on the end of your twigs. No, the answer is to go back and examine your faith. If your life is not demonstrating fruit, there is something wrong with the root. There's something wrong with your faith. A couple of weekends ago, Pastor Jeff and I went over to Melbourne, and we hopped on a plane. And of course, we went over to Melbourne, and the plane brought us home again. And it's one thing to believe that this huge chunk of metal can fly. It's another thing to hop on the plane and take off. The proof that you really believe that the plane can fly is if you're willing to board, sit down, and enjoy the pretzels. And it is one thing to say that Jesus is my Lord. It's another thing to actually every day, because you believe that he is your Lord, surrender to his Lordship, and through his strength, do what he says. Now, Jesus, when he says this, he's not saying that we have to be absolutely perfect in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. We're not going to be perfect. Jesus knows this. We all fall in many ways. And what Jesus and the rest of the New Testament teaches is that if someone has genuinely expressed saving faith, then there will be gradual progressive change in your life. There will be this increasing growth in holiness and dependence on God. But he is making the point that if you believe something is true, if you believe something is true, it should result in actions. So not everyone who makes a profession of faith actually possesses salvation. But there is a second reason why not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's because on the other end of the spectrum, so on this end of the spectrum, not everyone who professes possesses salvation. But on the other end of the spectrum, not everyone who serves knows God. Look down in verse 22. Jesus says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, how can this be? I mean, look at the two acts that Jesus is speaking about. Prophesying and casting out demons. Out of any acts of service that he could have chosen, these two are the most extreme, aren't they? How can people who are doing these works not be part of the kingdom of heaven? I mean, how can anyone who has the spiritual authority to prophesy, to legitimate, and I think this is legitimate prophecy, to tell events in the future, how can someone have the spiritual authority to cast a demon out of someone and yet not be part of the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Well, Jesus explains in Matthew 24, 24 this. He says, For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect. And then in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 8 and 9, he writes this. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. So it is possible that signs and wonders can be counterfeited by Satan. I have people come to me all the time really excited about some church or some person who has got some apparent spiritual authority. That's not the test. That's not the test. That's not the test. That, that spiritual authority can come from Satan. But even if it does not, in the Bible, we do read, and this is even ha more harrowing, about unbelievers who were temporarily moved by God's Spirit to do great things for God. Balaam, in the Old Testament, he gave 
a message, an accurate message. But as far as we can tell, he was never a follower of God. King Saul was used by God. We read this earlier in the year that the spirit of prophecy came upon him and he started to prophesy. It was legitimate prophecy. But he was lost. And even Judas, as one of the 12, was given the authority by Jesus to cast out demons. But ultimately, because of his actions, it demonstrated that he was an unbeliever. So here's the point. Not everyone who serves knows God. Just because you're serving God in some incredible ways does not mean you actually know him. In fact, your service can just be an act of lawlessness. If your, if your service is done to glorify yourself, if it's the motivation to glorify yourself and not God, then it's an act of lawlessness, even though that act might still bless other people. And so... Why must we make sure that we have made a conscious personal decision to trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Because not everyone who professes salvation actually possesses salvation, and not everyone who serves God knows God. That is harrowing. You've probably heard of the great Christian evangelist Billy Graham, but you've probably never heard of one of Billy Graham's friends, Charles Templeton. In 1936, Templeton was converted, and in the same year, he became an evangelist. In 1941, he founded a church. And then in 1945, he met with a number of youth leaders from around the United States, and I've heard about this amazing prayer meeting where God's spirit moved, and they decided to form Youth for Christ. And shortly afterwards, um, Templeton and Graham, they went on an evangelistic tour throughout Western Europe, and they roomed together and they held evangelistic crusades in Scotland and England and Ireland and Sweden and many other countries. And many people came to know Christ through the preaching of Charles Templeton. Now, out of anyone that you would have thought to possess salvation, it would have been him. I mean, here's a guy who's founded churches, who was part of the founding of Youth for Christ, who, who traveled with Billy Graham and preached up on stage, and people would stream down the front at the end of his message. But in 1948, Templeton attended Princeton Theological Seminary, and in 1957, after a long struggle with doubt, Templeton declared himself an agnostic. And through the rest of his life, his faith was at sea. Even though he professed salvation, he didn't possess it. Even though he served God, he didn't really know God. And maybe that might be you today. You might profess to know Christ, but does your life demonstrate that you really do? You might be serving Christ, but he might say, depart from me, I never really knew you. That's why. That's why we've got to make sure we've made this personal conscious decision to trust in Jesus Christ. And so we've looked today at the words, enter, Beware, and not everyone. But I want to look at the final word today, and that's the word everyone. You see, Jesus concludes his sermon in verse 24 with these words. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Everyone. Salvation is for everyone. Everyone who hears the words of Jesus and does them. And in saying this, Jesus is defining for us exactly what saving faith is. We've seen in the, in the previous paragraph that you can profess and not possess, and you can serve and not really know. But now Jesus tells us exactly what saving faith involves. And saving faith involves three parts. The first aspect of saving faith, faith involves hearing or understanding. In order to make a person personal conscious decision to trust in Jesus, you must understand who he is. You must hear about how he's the son of God, how he's fully God and fully man. You must hear about the gospel, how he died for your sins and how he was raised from the dead. However, just hearing is not enough. There is a second aspect to saving faith. You must not only hear and understand, but you must believe that these things are true. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists 
and he rewards those who seek him. So saving faith involves hearing, but it also involves believing that what you've heard is actually true. But get this. This is where most people stop. They hear, and then they assent to what they believe is true. But there is actually a third aspect to saving faith. The third aspect to saving faith is that you must make a conscious decision to make what you've heard the foundation of your life. You see, every person is building their life on something. Whether you're conscious or not of it, your life is built on some type of foundation. There is something around which you built your identity, from which you find your meaning and purpose. My brothers and my father are here today, and they will attest that growing up, what I was building my meaning and identity and purpose on was music. I was into music. Steve and I, we wanted to be like Midnight Oil. I won't get him up to demonstrate, but, but we were quite good at doing impressions of the oils. But really, what I was basing my life around was myself. Myself. You see, we all start out basing our lives around ourself, living in the kingdom of self. The only problem is, is that we were never created to live for the kingdom of self. We were created to live for the kingdom of God. We were created to love God and build our identity around God and get our meaning and our purpose and our joy from knowing God. You see, just as the sun is the center of our galaxy or whatever it is, solar system, thank you, you are not meant to be the center of the universe. You are meant to orbit around God. And since this universe... Since you, you do make yourself the center of the universe, that's divine treason. And there is coming a day, and this is how Jesus ends the sermon, when the ultimate storm that you will face in life will come, where you will die, and you will stand before your creator, and the foundation on which you've built your life will be revealed. If you've built your life for the kingdom of self, then Jesus says, you're going to suffer loss. And he loves us. And he's warning us. And all throughout these paragraphs, he has said this theme over and over again. In verse 13, he says, you will suffer destruction. In verse 19, he says, you'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. In verse 23, he says, you'll be cast away from the presence of God. And now in verse 27, he says, you will suffer loss. And so all these are just ways of saying the same thing, that if you don't turn from living for yourself, living for the kingdom of self, and make a, a conscious personal decision to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then when you die, you're going to hell. And that is why you need to repent. That is why you need to turn from living self, and you need to trust in Jesus and make the decision to, to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And the amazing news of the gospel is this, is the one that is warning you, Jesus, is the one who on the cross suffered destruction on your behalf. The one who is warning you is the one whose body was cut down and cast into the grave. The one who is warning you is the one who was cast away from the presence of God. And on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus died for you so that you, a rebel, might get off the broad road and enter by the narrow grate and get onto the narrow road which leads to life. And that's because he loves you. But you have to make the decision. He's worked by his spirit. He's working by his spirit in your heart. And he's preaching his word to you through the Bible. But you have to make that conscious decision. So I hope that you would make that decision today. Enter. Because not all religions are teaching the same thing. There is a narrow goat gate which leads to life. And the pathway you are on by default is leading you to destruction. Beware. Not all voices are telling you the same thing. About God, you may be deceived. And not everyone who professes to be a Christian is actually one. And everyone who hears the words of Jesus and believes them and takes them to the core of their being will be saved on that final day. So enter. 
this morning. Have you made that decision yet? Have you made a conscious, personal decision to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I want to challenge you to make that decision right now. This moment, today, right now. If you're here this morning and you're toying up whether you've made the decision or not, you don't know whether you've made it or not, chances are you may not have made it. Because once we trust in Christ and receive him as our Lord and Savior, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. Now, I'm not saying we don't go through periods of doubt. We all do. But you can look back to a time where you could say, yes, I made that decision and God changed my life. And if you can't look back today, then you need to make that decision today. Don't put it off. Make the decision today to trust in Jesus Christ. Enter into the kingdom. Enter into the kingdom.